There's a poem that was written more than a hundred years ago. It was entitled, The Hound of Heaven. This poem changed lots of people's lives. Very famous people said that this poem was one of the ones that really, really touched them and changed them. Some of those people who were touched by this poem were G.K. Chesterton, if you know his name, J.R.R. Tolkien, the one who wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy, uh, C.S. Lewis, John Stott, and even Fox News commentator Kirsten Powers. All of these were changed by this poem called Hound of Heaven. It's pretty long, 182 lines. I'm not going to read it today, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about who wrote it. It was written by a very devout Roman Catholic man who had a very tortured life. He had hoped to become a priest, and then he hoped to become a doctor, but he fell into very, very difficult financial times, and he had no money to go to school. So he decided he was going to pursue a career as a writer, but as again I said, he had no money. So he went about selling matches on the streets of London, and he had to even borrow paper to use to write his poems. That's how low he got, but it got worse. He developed a a, a neurological condition, and to try to deal with his pain, he started to take a concoction of opium and ethanol, which led to him becoming a cocaine addict, which led to tuberculosis, And then he died 47 years of age. But the legacy of his life was he left this poem. It begins, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. It's the story of him running from God, but God hounding him. That's why it's called the hound of heaven. And toward the end, it has this line where God speaks, says, rise, clasp my hand and come. And he did. Here's a man who had a very difficult life, but he left for us a poem that tells us that there is a hound of heaven, a God who looks for us. Now, most people believe wrongly that this is the way life works. God created this world, beautiful world, with all these wonderful people like ourselves, and we spend most of our time out looking for God. And of course, God is hiding somewhere, and we got to try to find him somewhere. And some succeed and some fail. That's what we think. But that could not be farther from the truth of the Bible. Someone, I I came across this just this week, this little article, it's called The Marvelous Magnet. And this man named Daniel Strange wrote this. Humanity is playing a cosmic game of hide and seek. And we think that God is hiding while we've honestly been looking for him. But according to the Bible, we're the ones who are hiding. And God is jumping up and down. And Christ is saying, here I am. Here I am. It can't be clear. You see, the Bible says clearly that we do not look for God. In fact, Paul says in Romans, remember, we went through Romans last year. It says this. There is no one who's righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. So the reality of life on this planet, very contrary to what we think is, none of us are out seeking for God. You might think, well, wait a minute. We've got all these religious people on earth. Yes, that's right. But what we generally speak is we are looking for a God of our own making. A God that looks like us. A God that fits our standards. But we're not looking for the real God. But the truth is a much greater truth. God is looking for us. If 
500 years ago, just a couple years ago, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. That, of course, is associated with Martin Luther. As you know, he was a Roman Catholic monk who broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, though he did not want to do so, because he started to look at the scriptures and realize that what he had been taught was false. And then to summarize the Reformation, Protestants, which we are, they came up with five words or five phrases that have the word sola in them. Sola means alone. The first one, sola scriptura. The Bible alone is our source of authority, not the teachings of Joe Schmo or the church or any councils. The Bible alone is our source of authority. The second one, sola Christus. Christ alone is our Savior. Nothing else. Christ alone. The third one, sola gratia, which means we are saved by grace alone. What makes us saved is because God is unconditionally loving toward us. We are not toward him. He's after us. We're saved by grace alone. And then sola fide, which means by faith alone. And then sola Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. That summarizes what we believe as Protestants. We're saved by grace through faith alone. If you want to see those solas depicted in living color, there's probably no better place to look than Daniel chapter 4. And that's where we're going to look today. And Daniel chapter 4 is uh, the story of a man. And that man is the man Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon and one of the most important people in all of human history. Certainly, he'd be in the top uh, 20. Top 20 leaders who have ever lived on the planet Earth. Nebuchadnezzar is one of them. And as you know, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, we've been looking at the book of Daniel. He appears in chapter after chapter, one, two, three, and now four. After this chapter, he's not going to be in the book of Daniel anymore. But today, this is going to fixate on him and his life and more of his dreams. So with your Bible or your tablet or your uh, cell phone, whatever it may be, let's turn to Daniel chapter four. And we're going to learn today about the hound of heaven, how God is going to hound this man until he gets him. Now, who we're talking about is Nebuchadnezzar. As I said, one of the greatest leaders of one of the greatest empires in the history of the world. That's pretty high praise. He deserves it. He is a big, big, big wig. And one of his policies as he conquered country after country, nation after nation, culture after culture, people after people, he realized that they had different gods. And as you know, having a multiple of, of different gods in one kingdom can pose a problem. So he would just accept their gods and say, well, you join into ours and we'll have your gods will be part of our gods of Babylon. But he came to one little tiny group of people who had a problem with that because they said, oh, no, 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 we're not into the gods. There is one true God, the most high God, the God of the people of Israel. And that was, of course, a problem for Nebuchadnezzar because he did not come from that mindset at all. But we're going to find in this chapter that he has a dream. Remember, he's got lots of dreams, very vivid dreams, very important dreams. Because when he lived, and even today, Americans are odd in this. Most people in the world believe their dreams are significant. And in the world of the Bible, dreams were very significant and they meant something. So he, we're going to find that he has a dream. Now, the chapter we're going to look at today, chapter four, we don't know the time frame. In the previous chapters and in the ones that are going to come, it tells us the exact date when the chapter took place. You can put it to a very specific day in history, not chapter four. There are no dates. But we believe because we're going to find Nebuchadnezzar on his rooftop overlooking the city of Babylon with all these incredible buildings that he had built, admiring his great 
great empire. Well, that didn't take place until toward the end of his life. And he had a very long reign, over 40 years. So we think that this passage took place when he is toward the end of his life, and Daniel is probably in his 50s. Remember when we first met him? He's about 15. Now he's probably in his 50s. So keep that in, in your mind. And this chapter is going to be strange because it's going to begin with the conclusion. Because this chapter is written as a, as a document, an autobiographical document written by King Nebuchadnezzar, who starts with the conclusion and a proclamation to all of his people. And then he's going to tell the story. And then he's going to conclude with the proclamation at the end again. So we're going to see how God is going to break this great man down, who's a very arrogant, ego-driven narcissistic egotist and how God is going to bring him to be a man who's humbled and acknowledges the one true God. How's he going to pull it off? This chapter is going to show us how. So please look at your Bibles. And here, as I said, the chapter is going to begin with the conclusion. Here's our verses one through three. King Nebuchadnezzar, Here's his proclamation. To the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. Now remember, he's the king of an enormous empire composed of many different nations. And so he issues this proclamation to all of them. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the most high God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, in the previous chapters, as you remember, God showed to Nebuchadnezzar signs and wonders. He saw people go into a fiery furnace and not even be singed, and a fourth person in there with him. He saw it with his own eyes. He, he saw a, a, a young man, maybe 15 or 16 years of age, not only interpret his dream, but told him what he dreamed, claiming that he got that insight from God. He saw miracles in front of his eyes, but it didn't change him. Hardly at all. But now he's going to tell us in chapter 4, something changed. Because now he's going to tell us about what God did to him to change him finally. You see, he was a very, very successful man. He lived at a time when um, things were good. And that's what we're going to find in the next few verses. Look at verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream but they could not interpret it for me. And by the way, those words are probably better translated. They did not interpret it for me because there's strong indication they could understand this dream, but they did not want to tell him what it said. They could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar. After the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now, um, did you see, by the way, um, this man, the, 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 the narcissist? <laughs> I, I, I went through these verses and I counted the eyes, my's, and me's. 15. 
<laughs> All he thinks, I did this and my and me. That's the way he lives his life. He, everything is about him. And political people tend to be that way, as you know. And he's, uh, he looks about what he's done. He's probably a man uh, uh, toward the end of his life. And he looks at all of his accomplishments and they were formidable. Militarily, he had conquered the world. His kingdom was stable. Materially, riches were pouring into his national treasury. He was enjoying the fruits of incredible building projects. Some two of the greatest wonders in the world were within sight of his eyes, right in front of him. But just when he was seemed to have everything he longed for in life, God sent a dream that shook him up and he's terrified and he couldn't sleep. And so what did he do? He had a nightmare. So he calls in the professionals, the professional dream interpreters. And the implication is that they could understand this dream. In fact, we're going to find the dream in a few minutes here. And I would suspect that some of us, in this room, who have no background in interpreting dreams, could interpret it for him. The problem is not interpreting this dream. The problem is telling the king what the interpretation is, because it is really, really bad. Let's say there's a very, very high official for whom you work, and they have a dream, and they know you can uh, interpret dreams, and they say, hey, come, tell me what my dream is. And you understand what the dream is. You go, I'm not telling him. No way. Because the dream tells him he's in deep, deep, deep weeds. He's going to be in trouble. And I'm not going to be the bearer of bad news. And so it seems as if the king's wise guys, they understand the dream. But they are chickens. Because they are not going to tell the king what the dream means. But there was a man of incredible integrity, and we're going to see his integrity now come out in the rest of the book. This man, Daniel, now not a young man. He's middle-aged now, in his 50s, and he's brought before the king. And now, in verse 9, we see the king's dream. I said, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying on my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Now, we have found, archaeologists have found inscriptions they've uncovered from the earth of Babylon, which compares Babylon to a spreading tree. The scriptures often use the image of a spreading tree as a symbol of political authority. So this is a very common image in Babylon and in the rest of the Bible. The tree grew large and strong. Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was extremely large and very strong. Its top touched the sky. As he looks outside his balcony there in front of him, 30 stories high is a ziggurat, a pyramid, building up toward heaven, a, a, a religious building like the pyramids of Egypt, not quite that big, but very large, right in front of his eyes. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter. The birds lived in its branches, and from it, every creature was fed. Here was this enormous tree, and this tree was providing shade and food for a huge number of people, a very successful kingdom. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked. 
And there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. Now the mood's going to change completely because now as he sees this big tree, he now hears a messenger, a message from someone like, uh, like an angel. Actually, the, the, the real word there is a watchman. A watchman comes in and now is going to start to speak. Now notice that before it was talking about a tree, but look at how the words change. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let live, let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal until seven times pass for him. So you see the image. And by the way, I, I, I'm no dream interpreter, but I could figure this one out easily. This one's not tough. Here was a great tree depicting his incredible empire that feeds thousands and millions of people. Everyone's happy, doing really well. And then a messenger comes in and says, um, let him, who's the him? The Nebuchadnezzar. So things are going to change for him. This one who's at the head of this spreading tree is now going to be drenched with dew. Who's going to live with animals. Who's going to have a mind that's changed from the mind of a man to the mind of an animal until seven times pass for him. The word times there is seasons. Most to depict that as seven years, but when the word number seven is used in the Hebrew scriptures, it means a time of completeness until something very important is going to be accomplished. Then he goes on. And this is again the, the messenger from God. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. Now there's the key. The messenger came and said, the reason for this that's about to happen is so that people can understand that God is sovereign. You are not. And guess who he puts in his top positions? Not good people. J. Vernon McGee writes a comment on this verse. Sets them over the lowliest of people. Here's what he writes. God says that he puts on the thrones of this world the basest of men. In other words, God gives us the kind of rulers we deserve and the kind we want. There have been many rulers who had bats in their belfries and were off their rockers. If you look at human history, it is full of horrible leaders. And sometimes, I don't know if you've had this thought, but I have. Aren't there better people? Are we that bad that these are the best we've got? Well, God says, no, they aren't the best. I put the bad ones. These are not the best you've got. Nor are you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're not the best. God puts the lowliest of people there in high places sometimes. Why? Because he raises people up and puts them down. Well, verse 18 says, This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means. For none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can. Because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So Daniel's on the hot seat. Now, you know this to be true. Anyone who is in a position of leadership, especially high office, it is very, very difficult to avoid the malady of self-delusion. Why? Because you're surrounded by worshipers. Everyone is telling you how wonderful you are when that is a bunch of baloney. Why are they telling you that? Well, because their positions are dependent on it. And because they get perks by telling you that. And after a while, when you're told how wonderful you are, it goes to your head. That's why 
That's one of the great dangers. In the book of Proverbs, it says that the heart is tested by the praise one receives. If you let the praise you receive go to your head and make you arrogant, it's just depicted what your heart is really like. You're an arrogant person. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is. And now in verse 19, Daniel, a brave soul, is going to tell the king what it means. Here's what happens. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So Daniel knew what the dream meant, and he does not want to tell the king. <laughs> you wouldn't either. Well, I mean, who wants to be the bearer of bad news? Say, hey, king, you're going to turn into a, 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 a goat. I mean... You want to tell somebody that? Especially someone who can kill you on the spot? No. Make it worse. What if the news you have to bear is horrible, but you really like the person you work for? That was Daniel's per- pers- That's where Daniel was. Daniel liked King Nebuchadnezzar. They worked together like this for many years. And now Daniel's got to be the one to bear incredibly bad news. And so he's perplexed and he's troubled. And the king, obviously a very intelligent man, reads his face. Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered. Listen to Daniel's reply. My Lord. If only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. I wish, I wish, King, I know what this means. And I I wish it applied to somebody else, but it doesn't. Here's verse 20. The tree you saw which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food for all, giving shelter to the wild animals and having nesting places for its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky And your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field while its roots remain in the ground. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live like the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. You see in there, there's some hope. This great tree is going to get cut off. But the roots are still intact and the stump is still alive. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar didn't hear that. So here's the interpretation, verse 24. This is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. This is going down pretty low. You will be driven away from people. That's a social component. You will live with the wild animals That's a physical and psychological component. You will eat grass. That affects your diet. You will live outside for a period of time. That's the time component. Until you acknowledge 
That's a spiritual component. But there's hope. The stump is still there. And you need to acknowledge the Most High God. Now, now that Daniel is going to slip into a word of advice, verse 27. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. This is not his dream anymore. Here's my advice to you, king. Repent, renounce your sins by doing what is right. And your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. By the way, you don't build magnificent cities like this without hurting people a lot, which is what he had done. It may be then that your prosperity will continue. Now, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, by the way, had a lot in common. Have you picked up on it? Both Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar were, were royalty. Remember the first chapter, Daniel has royal background. He's related to the kings of Israel, or the kings of Judah, rather. And Nebuchadnezzar, of course, has a royal background. Both are extraordinarily gifted. Both of them are very strong natural leaders. Both of them are wildly successful in their work. Both of them are at the top of their game. Both of them receive visions and dreams from God. But one of them was mega proud, and the other one was mega humble. Couldn't be more different. Someone said this, God is very able and will humble those who walk in pride, including us. And so, what's going to happen? Daniel has interpreted the king's dream. He begs the king to make a spiritual change in his life right now. And what happens? Nothing. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later. So a whole year's passed now. The king is still going out on his roof enjoying his beautiful kingdom. He said, oh, I guess that dream is gone. Never happened. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Did he get the message? No. In fact, he got worse. By the way, do you remember from the New Testament, King Herod Agrippa, was, and this is in Acts chapter 12, was, was, was making a speech. And here's what the Bible says. This is uh, Acts 12, verses 22 and 23. And the people were shouting, Agrippa is giving the voice of God, not the voice of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God and was eaten by worms. And he breathed his last. Here's another king saying, Everyone said, oh, you're such a wonderful leader. You've done all this for your glory. And he goes, yeah, right. Dead. God just knocked the guy off right there. No, you did not. It's like any leader saying, man, or even a church. Oh, man, I built a great church. You know, we even say this. This is how, we, how stupid we are. Well, this is so-and-so's church, Tom Hovestall's church. No, Thomas, Tom Hovestall's never had a church, never will have a church. Charles Swindoll's church, Tony Evans' church. No, no. No, there's only one church, Jesus' church. We're at best, at the very best, simple servants. That's all we are. It's never my church. It's Christ's church. But you see, when someone takes that glory, this is my kingdom. This is what I have accomplished. God says, wait a minute. Uh, you forgot something. No, you didn't. I did it. I used you, but I did it. And so what's going to happen now? He is going down. Why? This is a verse you probably don't want to memorize, but... <laughs> This is in Proverbs chapter 6. There are six things the Lord hates. Seven 
that are detestable to him. Now, we have our lists, by the way, especially we evangelicals in our society today, we have our lists of things that we do not like. But this is God's list. This is what he hates and that is detestable to him. Here's our list. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. God hates those things. The first on the list, haughty eyes. How different than the world in which we live today. You see, in our world today, in America, we less and less believe in the Bible. And whether we know it or not, we more and more believe in Friedrich Nietzsche. And this is what he said. He ridiculed humility, proposing that humility should be replaced by pride. And he believed that the ultimate human being was Superman. And Superman would ruthlessly exploit others for their own benefit. Unburdened by notions of sympathy or brotherly love, he himself boasted. Here's his words. I am not a man. I am dynamite. And my truth. Isn't that interesting? His words. My truth is fearful. That's Nietzsche. That's not God, by the way. Because God said love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. And it is not proud. That's what God said. What does pride look like in real life? Pride is not deriving legitimate pleasure from a job well done. That is good to do. If you've done a job well, you should derive pleasure from that. Pride is not um, reasonable and responsible self-esteem. We should have good esteem but that's based on the gifts of God. We, we, pride uh, means to, to have an accurate assessment of yourself. But did you see what pride looked like with Nebuchadnezzar? He was content with himself. He let success go to his head. He felt himself self-sufficient. He did not acknowledge the goodness of God. He did not give thanks to God. In fact, he congratulated himself. He promoted himself. He justified himself. And it had all degenerated into self-righteousness, which is, by the way, the worst and perhaps the only sin. There's only one. There's only one sin that can keep any human being out of heaven. Self-righteousness, because that means I don't need Jesus. I can do it myself. That's the ultimate and by far the worst sin, and he has it enormously. Here's verse 31. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all the kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. And immediately what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Now you look at that and go, oh, that's weird. It's not. Any people here who have got their counseling degree? If you go to the DSM manual, you'll find there are three diseases listed. They're, they're psychoses. One is called, um, um, the first one is called, um, if I can remember, boanthropy. That is people who think they are a bovine, a cow. And by the way, um, when, when Rachel came up with this picture for our, our hound of heaven today, at first I thought, hey, Rachel, that's not a hound. That's an ox. 
And then she reminded me of the text of scripture <laughs> because that, that is a very well-known psychological disease, boanthropy. There's another one called lycanthropy. That's where a person thinks they're like a wolf or zooanthropy, where a person believes they're an animal. I was listening to NPR some years ago, and uh, the interviewer in NPR was, intervie was interviewing a man. I believe it was in Portland area. No big surprise. And, and, and this father believed that his child should be able to choose their own species. Not gender, species. And at that point, the son had decided he was a squirrel. And so the father was being interviewed about how he's promoting his child being a squirrel. And, and, and by the way, this is not a joke. I'm, and I, and, and I, I said, no, no, this can't be possible. And the last line I remember well. The interviewer asked this father, what would you think if your child decided that he was a human being? Verbatim, I would be very disappointed. Who had the psychosis? I wondered. That's crazy. I don't know if he ate nuts and lived in a tree or not. I don't know, but it's a very real disease. And you know who one of the ones who identified it? Sigmund Freud. And you know when Freud was looking into this disease, you know what he discovered? That it's connected between dreams that people have that come to fulfillment in the way they live their lives. It's a real deal. It's not, it's rare, but it's real. And so apparently King Nebuchadnezzar came down with boanthropy, this disease by which he thought that he was a cow or an ox. For how long that happened, we don't know. Could be seven years. Interestingly, in the Babylonian records, there's a period toward the end of his life that is silent. We don't know what happened. It's possible Daniel ruled the kingdom while the king was in the courtyard eating the grass so they didn't have to mow. I don't know. But, but that's what happened. I remember some time ago reading this. Uh, there was a historian. His name was Charles Beard. And Charles Beard was uh, asked by a publishing company if he would be willing to write a short summary of world history. And he said he could do that in four sentences. <laughs> he said he didn't have to write a book. He could do it in four sentences. And this is what he said. Number one, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad with power. In other words, power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Number two, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly small. What goes around comes around. Justice will be served, ultimately. Number three, the bee fertilizes the flower it robs. And number four, when it is dark enough, you can see the stars. The greatest leaders come out in times of greatest darkness. Who do we consider our greatest leader as a nation? Abraham Lincoln. Why? That was our darkest chapter in our nation's history. Well, C.S. Lewis said, If anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And that's a biggish step, too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. You don't even see it. Well, what happened? Nebuchadnezzar got the point. He finally gets it. This is verse 34. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is an autobiography, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back His hand or say to Him, What have you done? He looked up rather than looking out at his great kingdom. He recognized that God restored his mind. He did not restore his mind. And now he used his restored sanity 
to acknowledge the true God, to bless God, to worship God, and to commit himself to God. And what happened? Verse 36. At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out. And I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And here's his summary. Those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. How do we know? Because that's what happened to him. So what? How do we end? First of all, let's take a look at Nebuchadnezzar's spiritual pilgrimage. Where did it begin? It began with this man raised in a polytheistic culture, worshiping all these wackadoodle gods that most people in the world worship today, by the way. That's where it began. And then what did God do? God placed into Nebuchadnezzar's life, a young man named Daniel who would change the king's life forever. And not just Daniel, but other people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God surreptitiously put these people into his life. He never knew it. These were exiles. These were like slaves that he had taken from another country. Little did he know that these exiles we're going to change his life forever. And then undoubtedly, the Holy Spirit was at work, convicting him of sin and righteousness and justice and judgment. And then as Nebuchadnezzar's spiritual pilgrimage went on, he saw the fraudulence of his quote unquote, holy men who were a bunch of quacks. And then God in his mercy started to give Nebuchadnezzar some dreams, trying to show him that there was a true God who does want to, 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 to reveal God's truth to him. And then God gave him the opportunity with his own eyes to see God's miraculous power in the fiery furnace. And it did nothing. It didn't change his heart a bit. And then God gives him 30 years to build his kingdom. Probably using off of people's backs, hurting people, oppressing people. God gave him 30 years to build his kingdom, but he still clung to his pagan gods. He said, Daniel, that's your God, but these are my gods. And so what does God do? If I were God, I'd blow the dude off. He didn't. God gives him another dream. And Daniel interprets the dream. And then what does God do? Daniel says, please repent. And what does the king do? He does not repent. He goes on his merry way for another whole year. And what does God do? The hound of heaven is always there. And then finally God breaks him down. He struck with a form of madness and he began to understand his weakness and his folly. And he realized his utter dependence on God. And he was a broken man and he was convicted of his sin. And he acknowledged the sovereignty of the true God. And he prayed to God and he praised God and he confessed with his mouth and he worshiped the true God. Because I think somewhere, and he isn't going to be on a throne, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar is up there in heaven. Jesus will be on that throne. Nebuchadnezzar won't. I think he'll be there. Why? He got it. Have you ever thought, in fact, maybe this is an assignment for you in this week. Write down your spiritual pilgrimage. Who are the people God's brought into your life? What are the events that God has done? How are the times when we, God tried to show us his way, but we turned away. Maybe the failures that God allowed to be in our lives so we'd be broken and we finally fall to our knees and say, oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Write down your spiritual pilgrimage. How did the hound of heaven get you? Well, this also tells us that God rules. We don't rule. God is doing his purpose in the world. If you think God's picking the best leaders, <laughs> you're, you're mistaken. 
In fact, I'll give you a test. It's time for you to select a world leader and your vote counts. Here's the three candidates. Number one, A. This person works with um, mob people. He consults with astrologists. He said two mistresses. He chain smokes and drinks eight to ten martinis every day. Number two, B. He was kicked out of office twice, sleeps till noon, used opium in college, and drinks a quart of brandy every evening. C. Is a decorated war hero, vegetarian, doesn't smoke, drinks only an occasional beer, and hasn't had any illicit affairs. Well, A is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, B, Winston Churchill, and C, Adolf Hitler. Sometimes <laughs> we don't really understand what God's up to. But Daniel 4 is a primer on pride and humility. Remember what Jesus told us the story? These two people came into the, the temple to worship. One was a Pharisee, a very religious person. The other was a tax collector, very lowly. The religious person comes in and says, Oh, I thank you, God, how good I am. You know, I, I gave my money to build this great place, and I tithe, and I'm, I do all the right things religiously. And it says that the tax collector couldn't even lift up his eyes. He kind of stumbles in, and he simply goes beats his chest and says, Oh God, have mercy on me, the sinner. And Jesus said, this one went home justified rather than the other. For whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So the question is, what's our pride quotient? <laughs> because if we're in the business of exalting our ego, we have an opponent that is very strong. But when we want to see the ultimate example of humility, we only look one place. And that's to Jesus. Listen to Paul's description of his humility. Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And by the way, almost all splits of churches including this one, take place not because of doctrinal differences, but generally because of human pride. That's why it happens. Because that's what he's talking about here. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus, who being God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He he could have done whatever he wanted. He's God. What did he do? He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There it is. Here's someone who could, take, could have used every prerogative of God that he wanted. And instead of doing that, he made himself a servant, washing even his disciples' feet and going to the cross. And what's the result? Every single being that's ever existed will one day bow the knees before Jesus. Everyone. And I'd rather make that choice myself rather than have someone force it on me. And that's the privilege we have. God gives us the, cho the choice of bowing our knees now before the God of heaven like Nebuchadnezzar ultimately did, one of the most powerful people the world has ever seen. God brought this powerful, egotistical, selfish idiot, probably murderer, 
to himself and made him a child of God. He offers the same to us. Let's pray. Oh, you are a gracious God. Some of us here today have probably had it really, really rough in life. We've had every disadvantage. We've been mistreated. And you love them. I pray that they, they would know that you love them, no matter what they've done, where they've been. None of them are as bad as Nebuchadnezzar. May you, the hound of heaven, hound them, Father, with your incredible love and grace. And for people like myself who have had many, many advantages, many good things, we too are prone to wander from you to think that somehow we're responsible for the good things we've enjoyed. Not true. Help us to also recognize you as the God who has given us everything good we enjoy and we worship you. May this become a church full of humble, powerful, courageous, worshipful people whose lives are simply a response to your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.